Oh, Richard Ledbetter, stealer of dreams. Well, I suppose it's a bit of a case of blaming the messenger uh, in this case. He's not responsible for uh, what I'm about to tell you, but he is, uh, again, I, I would consider him a highly respected source of kind of information on on hardware and so on. This is, uh, if you're looking at the picture in front of you or on the screen in front of you, the image, this is of David Ledbetter on the, I think it's David Ledbetter on the left and one of his uh, compatriots at Digital Foundry, which is a YouTube channel slash site that's affiliated with, I believe, both Eurogamer and I think gamesindustry.biz. And these guys uh, specialize very much in the tech side of things in video gaming, both on console and on PC. And they do analysis of, of leaks and so on of tech specs on, on new consoles and gaming devices before they're released. And then even more kind of go into deeper dive stuff after they've been released. And these guys are quite, you know, uh, technically astute. They do know what they're talking about. And they have come out with an article and video which you can find on YouTube. Again, Digital, Digital Foundry has its own YouTube channel on the Nintendo Switch. Uh, they've been able to confirm um, uh, information that's been reported elsewhere. I'll leave a link to their video in the description below and you can check it out. It's very informative about what appears to be the final hardware specs uh, of the Nintendo Switch. Apparently, it is based off NVIDIA's Maxwell architecture. I myself have a Maxwell architecture-based graphics card, a GTX 970, which is a pretty damn good graphics card, and it's still pretty competitive, although, again, this replacement, the 1070, I think pretty much blows it out of the water. But uh, that's the way it is in the PC space. One minute, you're uh, uh, top of the top of the hit at the... well top of the mountain and the next moment you're in you're in the gutter but uh, in terms of performance but what what effectively has happened is that what they've uh, digital foundry report as i've said is that they've confirmed that this nintendo switch is a maxwell part it uses a maxwell specifically maxwell specifically the mobile version of the maxwell Arch nvidia maxwell architecture which is known as tegra specifically the tegra x1 um, architecture um, the X1 and the X2 the X2 is based off the frankly at this stage pretty much brand new only first uh, came out this year uh, Pascal architecture chips um, they're made in a more advanced fabrication process I think it is 16 or is it 14 nanometer I can't remember which compared to 20 for the Maxwell and it's also crucially it's a fin fet process which means that there's some sort of 3d or three-dimensional methods used in the production of the transistors or the transistors used are three-dimensional in nature again you'd have to go into the you know there's there's more specific information on fin fet out there but suffice it to say the two things in combination make pascal chips vastly more energy efficient then their immediate predecessors, the late gen kind of current model or late generation Maxwell chips. In terms of design, like things like CUDA cores, as they say in the video, um, Maxwell and Pascal are comparatively close. But because of the much more advanced fabrication process, Pascal are much more energy efficient. They produce an awful lot less heat, and that allows you to run them at much higher uh, frequencies, which gets you more grunt. And apparently, one of the main the, one of the main differentiators between uh, Tegra X1, which is Maxwell, and Tegra uh, X2, which is Pascal, is that uh, while there are some differences in the CUDA cores and other stuff, the, one of the main differences is the much more advanced fabrication process allows Pascal to run in the form of uh, Tegra X2 to run at much higher speeds. I think 50% higher clock speeds on the, Jeep, on the, on the graphics side resulting in a significant, as you can imagine, the 50% boost in frequency, a significant boost in raw performance um, over the X1. Not only that, I mean, that, I mean, that's okay, that's, you know, that's one thing as in and of itself. In other words, they've gone with a less, uh, an, an architecture, Maxwell, that was designed to use a less advanced, much less energy efficient uh, fabrication process. But on top of that, they're they're not pushing it to its limits. The Tegra X1, I think on the processor side, maxes out at uh, 2 gigahertz. 
and I believe the on the graphics part side of things, it maxes out, I think, at about 800 megahertz, if memory serves. And in the case of what they're now reporting on the Nintendo Switch, the CPU cores, of which there are four ARM cores, uh, quite modern ones uh, in relative terms, are running at 1,200 megahertz apiece. Uh, for all four of them and they run they, and this crucially this frequency uh, this speed is fixed so when you're you're using the nintendo switch on the go or when you've plugged it into a uh, wall socket and it's running off you know you've plugged it into the dock and it's been powered off the wall socket the cpu frequency is the same and um, the reason for this obviously is that while you can uh, if you want to run in the game a game in in mobile mode on the lower resolution screens, I think it's a 720p screen compared to full HD HD 1080p when it's in TV mode. Uh, whether yeah yeah you'll you'll need more graphics grown to do it at 1080p than 720p, but the stuff behind the scenes, the artificial intelligence, the physics, the collision detection, those requirements stay static whether you're in in mobile mode or. Uh, hooked up to a docking station so the fact that it's fixed either in docked or undocked at 1020 1020 megahertz uh, is uh, no surprise in terms of the frequency being fixed but that is literally a tinch over uh, half the maximum uh, cpu frequency of the uh, tegra architecture on the gpu sp side the gpu runs at two different speeds at undocked or should i say if i go first with docked speed is 768 megahertz which is not too below it's a maximum speed i believe which is 800 megahertz but and this is the the crucial but part uh when in mobile mode it runs at only 307.2 megahertz which is again something like 40 something percent of the speed it runs at when it's plugged into the docking station now admittedly you're talking about 720p compared to 1080 but that's still a pretty dramatic drop in in graphics uh, frequency uh, it should also be noted again that the maximum frequency for i can't I don't know the exact number for uh, for tegra x2 slash pascal but it is considerably higher than that because the that again pascal benefits from a two manufacturing processes both 16 or 14 nanometer i think it's 16 nanometer and finfet that hugely improve energy efficiency allowing the chip to run at much higher speeds while consuming and uh, less power and producing less heat so what this means what this means in terms of again other specs that have been leaked again they can't exactly 100 percent confirm um, is that the system has 25 gigabytes of main RAM bandwidth, which is more main RAM bandwidth than the Xbox 360 had, but less than half the main RAM, RAM bandwidth of the Xbox One, let alone the PS4. Um, it's, again, four ARM core CPU cores, and Nintendo are familiar with them because they've been using them uh, since the Game Boy Advance. Every smartphone uses them or has its CPU tech derived from them. Um, so that's not, you know, completely, completely outside the, you know, it's it's nothing terribly shocking there. But you know what it, what it effectively comes down to, a maxed out Tegra X one, uh, running on Android, um, could do Xbox three sixty games, at say I think Doom three, if I remember the quote, an example that Digital Foundry used in a previous video. Uh, was Doom 3 on the Xbox 360 version of the game ran at 720p at 60 frames a second with dips in the frame range when things got really busy uh, on I think it was the Android Shield device I believe uh, running on that uh, with the an with the uh, uh, Google Android or Google operating system uh on what is it called not google android it's called the nvidia shield yes when running on the nvidia shield which is a google android operating system you know system device on google android google android has a terrible graphics api because compared to ios because they never know because it's used in so many different uh different uh handhelds tablets and so on they never know the exact uh, graphic spec and as a result there's no kind of 
to the metal coating the way they would be and what's allowed uh, on uh, 360 or on on games consoles on the nintendo handhelds on uh, on well even on ios devices uh, which all have kind of a very fixed um, uh, chipset that's that, that's evolved generation after generation. Even with the Android a- having to deal with the Android API, um, from what I remember, uh, from what Digital Foundry have said previously, they were able to run uh, Doom 3 at 1080p at 60 frames per second locked. So it does have more grunt than the 360 um, because, again, it's architecturally much more modern. Um, the 360 and the PlayStation 3 don't have graphics ba- chip based compute in any form at all. Tegra X2 and X1 both have CUDA cores, so they both have graphics based compute. They're both, if memory serves, Shader Model 5 compliant. So they are architecturally, you know, in terms of the standards they're compliant with, they're more sophisticated than the 360 uh, and the uh, PlayStation 3. But they're certainly not up to Xbox One, let alone. Uh, playstation 4 levels of uh, of capability now apparently there has been some customizations done by nintendo but digital foundry and everyone else out there doesn't seem to know whether they're just relatively minor or quite extreme it should be noted in the whole android thing they have worked with nvidia to come up with a fixed api that um, that's again graphics interface that allows them uh, developers to get much closer to the metal than developers could on uh, the nvidia shield devices so real world performance is going to be well this is the thing it would be better than the nvidia shield but the problem is is that again the cpu cores are running at half the speed of uh, the nvidia shield so even though the on the graphics side when it's plugged into the dock the switch is close to nvidia shield level of performance the problem is is that the problem well the the problem is is that it doesn't matter how good your graphics chip is if your cpu can't ha- handle the workload ever you know the game will be slower than what you would like it's the reason why so many multi-platform games on playstation 4 uh maybe a 1080p compared to 900 on the xbox one but still only run at 30 frames per second it's the cpus which are the the processors which in the xbox one and the and the PlayStation 4 are identical AMD Jaguar cores, and there are eight of them in both machines uh, that hold um, the PlayStation 4 and the Xbox One back from rendering at, say, 60 frames per second at, say, 1080p and 900p, respectively. Although, again, there is something of a graphics chip grunt between the Xbox One and the PS4, so maybe it'd only be possible to do 60 frames as many of these multi platform games on the PS4. But still, it's not happening because the PS4 is held back by the processor. Um, and the same situation will be true with the Switch. If it's running compared to the NVIDIA Shield uh, devices, if it's running its CPU cores at only half the speed that they are in the NVIDIA Shield, then you're looking at some pretty, you know... I mean, yeah, why have they done it? Because this is obviously intended to be, if not completely, then certainly partially a portable device. Energy efficiency is important. They probably don't have an active cooling system, or if they do, it's very basic. Um, The list goes on. But um, frankly, you know, from there, if if this you know if this is correct, it has less than half the main RAM bandwidth of the Xbox One. Um, God, less than a quarter of the main RAM bandwidth, even less than that of maybe a fifth of the main RAM bandwidth of the uh, of the yeah, less than a you know because the the PlayStation Four is like a hundred and seventy one hundred 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 and seventy something range uh, gigabytes of main RAM bandwidth per second. The Xbox One runs its GDDR three or GDDR, you know, it calls three something video RAM and maximum speed and gets sixty eight gigabytes of main RAM bandwidth. So this is a 25 is, again, if the specs are are correct, is, you know, it's a, you know, it's, it's well, it's well behind in terms of, it has four gigs of RAM apparently, which if they dedicate the bare minimum to the operating system and background features, let's say 500 megabytes means they have almost as much RAM as the other two systems. But unless, unless uh, Nintendo has done some real interesting modifications and have added some kind of advanced, you know, features like, say, 
I, I couldn't name, you know, off the top of my head, I couldn't. There are the, some of them out there. The PlayStation 4 Pro uses some advanced stuff. Primitive Discard Unit, I think, is one. Or well, I might be mis- misnaming it. That identifies various objects that a GP would render that aren't actually visible on screen because something obscure, it's something obscuring them. It basically just tells the GPU not to render them, and that can free up quite a bit of resources. And then there's asynchronous compute and a couple of other things that could be thrown in as a customization, which might get some extra grunt. But I'd, I'd be, you know, you know, in the, the reveal trailer, the Switch, you know, one of the games, that the third-party game that was shown off on the Switch in the reveal trailer was Elder Scrolls Skyrim. Elder Scrolls Skyrim is a last-gen game. It's five years old. And Bethesda, if they wanted to, could probably port it to the platform. It's got a lot more main RAM than 360 did. It's got more main memory bandwidth. Not a huge amount, but still a bit more main memory bandwidth than the 360 did. Um, Its graphics architecture is certainly much more sophisticated. And they could either port from the 360 version or take the enhanced edition that's now appeared on current gen hardware and downgrade it to run on the Switch. Um, those are all possibilities, but unless Nintendo's got some kind of next level stuff thrown in there on top, some kind of special hardware source, which I think is highly, highly unlikely, then, you know, it's, right now, Nintendo seem to be positioning the Switch, they've said it, actually, oh, this is not the successor to the 3DS, you know, they better change their tune better, pretty damn quick on that. Um, because there's, unless, again, unless there's some kind of magical special hardware source in there, which I think is highly unlikely, this system is not going to compete with the Xbox One, let alone the PlayStation 4, let alone the PS4 Pro, which is already out, let alone the Xbox Project Scorpio, which is coming out near the end of uh, next year. And I cannot see, I mean, this is the same thing that happened with the Wii U, it's the same thing that happened with the with the Wii. You don't build hardware... Uh, or even with the the GameCube and even the N sixty four, this has been a problem since with Nintendo since the nineties. They don't build hardware that allows. I mean, people say, "Oh, Nintendo, oh, it's not about the graphics, it's not about the teraflops." Well, they're wrong. It is about the, if not about the graphics, it most definitely is about the teraflops because the teraflops, how much you know, stuff your GPU can throw on screen, how much. Uh, data you can stream from main RAM to the, the graphics chip and the CPU, how much physics and AI the CPU can deal with. You know, the capacity of your, whether you're using an optical disk format or expensive low-capacity cartridge, or whether you're using a, a low uh, an optical disk format, but one that has nothing like the capacity that the, everyone else in the industry is using. These things all do one thing, and that is that they prevent... They prevent both first party and more, and more importantly from Nintendo's perspective, third party developers and publishers from making the games they want to make. Activision wants to make Call of Duty. EA wants to make the new Mass Effect on Androm- Andromeda and Battlefield One. And if those games won't or can't run a Nintendo hardware, because for one reason or another, it's it just isn't up to the job. N sixty four has plenty of RAM, plenty of graphics rendering capacity, best of that generation, but cartridges with, that are both incredibly expensive. I mean, a CD-ROMs back in the N64 era would have been a dollar, two dollars to each to print maximum. Um, cartridges from the Nintendo N64 are apparently anywhere from fifteen dollars at a bare minimum, with a licensing fee on top. And if you wanted save game functionality or more capacity, they cost more. Even again, making them incredibly expensive. Uh, Square Enix. Square Enix wanted to make big, huge scale, high audio quality RPGs with FMV sequences. They couldn't do that on the N64, so they went to PlayStation. And Nintendo has never had the kind of high quality uh, fi- support from Square Enix, particularly in terms of, or s- was simply known as Square back in the day. That's before the uh, the there was a merger after that Final Fantasy movie got them into a huge amount of financial trouble. But uh, again, me going off on a tangent. The point is, is that again, same situation with the GameCube. The GameCube had great hardware in the box, certainly better hardware than the uh, than the, the the PlayStation Two. It had 
it had an internal, you know, there were certain, so you, could, you could argue in certain respects even had better capabilities than the, the Xbox did. But it didn't matter. And it didn't matter for two simple reasons. One, everyone else, PlayStation and Xbox, were using DVDs that could carry at least six gigs of data. While Nintendo continue, insisted on using the Nintendo discs, which were like 1.5 gigabytes in capacity. And the problem with this, of course, for those who, you know, again, don't know or don't remember back in the day, the the, th- I, the two or three of the biggest selling games of that console generation all had the words Grand Theft Auto in them. And for open world sandbox games, which really kicked off in that console generation, you need all the data in one place. You cannot be switching out one disc after another after another. It doesn't work that way. They're, you know, they're sandbox games. You have to have all the data, all your entire game world in a single disc so the player can go wherever they damn well please inside the game world because that's the way they're designed to work. So again, three of the biggest selling games, all of which hugely outsold the best selling games, but even first party ones on the GameCube, um, or at least close to it. Um, the Grand Theft Auto games 3, which I've actually never played, San Andreas, which I still think is the best soundtrack of any of the uh, Grand Theft Auto games today, uh, or not San Andreas, Vice City, and then San Andreas, um, you know, couldn't run on the GameCube uh, because the disc format's capacity was too low. And while you'll find many a Nintendo fan who says the GameCube controller was one of the best controllers ever and one of the best controller, the best controller of that generation, they're wrong. And the reason why they're wrong is while the kind of ergonomics in the GameCube controller in many specs are very, very good, the fact is the GameCube is the worst controller of that generation for one singular reason. It doesn't matter how good the ergonomics are if functionality is missing. The PlayStation 2 had the DualShock 2 controller. Uh, the Xbox had the next worst controller with the original Xbox controller, which was huge. And then they came out with that smaller Xbox controller, primarily for the Japanese market. And then that spread everywhere else and was much more popular. But those controllers are still better than the GameCube controller because the GameCube controller was not a proper dual analog stick controller. You had one stick on the left that was a proper one. And then you had that yellow thing on the other side which is you know if you're using your thumbs and it was hard to use it was very rigid it had a very high level of resistance and it just wasn't viable as a second analog stick so dual analog stick controls in third person shooters in fps's which again kicked off in that generation with halo and the call of duty if not one then two uh, on those platforms and um, again couldn't work on the gamecube and again, this is Nintendo putting, you know, intentionally or unintentionally putting obstacles in the way of third parties supporting their platform. And, you know, if Nintendo, as I said, I've said already in the video, they've been claiming this is not a successor to the 3DS. If they keep sticking to the dem- the statement that this is, you know, that this is their new home console, then they're going to, it's going to be like the Wii U, potentially like the Wii U all over again. The hardware is not up to the job of running uncompromised versions of current generation third party games. And the third parties, you know, they're you know, they're making, you know, particularly with the pretty good install base, the very good, fantastic install base, the PlayStation 4. I think it's close to 50 million or over 50 million units at this stage. Now, what the Xbox Ones are. But with those, you know, two install bases combined, there are, you know, there's now an awful lot more current gen consoles out at this stage, three years into their their lifespan than there were when the 360 and the PlayStation 3 were three and two years old, respectively. So there's a big install base out there. People are buying games. um, People are playing games. People are enjoying them. And again, within three months of, of the recording of this video, Nintendo is due to release a brand, well, three months and a bit, a brand new supposedly home console that won't run the vast majority of third-party games in an uncompromised, undegraded form, because they just won't... I mean, you know, what would... I mean, you know, why... I mean, there are... One of the the reasons, again, support is that's been suggested by Digital Foundry and a couple other sources as to why they went with Maxwell is because they just... they The Pascal and Tegra X2 just... They just wasn't... They couldn't get it into production early enough, quickly enough, basically. Um, And this is, again, you know, I I have, you know, 
I could do a separate video on on a rant about you know the kind of huge strategic mistakes the company has made. You know, I've already just said a bit of a rant in terms of the hardware. I could go on about the Wii being basically a souped-up GameCube. The Wii U, again, Zelda Breath of the Wild was shown off on on Jimmy Fallon Tonight Show and Jimmy, Jimmy Fallon, with Jimmy Fallon um, a week or two ago at this stage. I can't remember off the top of my head. And looked better than it did on the Wii U. And of course it did, because the Wii U is a piece of crap. The Wii U's processor is an IBM architecture, based on an IBM architecture, and I kid you not, from the 1990s, the Nintendo first used in the GameCube and then the Wii. They just up made it 64-bit and added three cores and out-of-order execution functionality to it and bunged it in the Wii. It can only run at 1.2 gigahertz, that chip uh, technology, so it was never capable of producing... 360 level of performance main ram bandwidth again it's got more main ram than the 360 and ps3 but it's running at just over half the speed so you get or just over half the bandwidth terrible making it non-viable for grand theft auto non-viable for the for elder scrolls skyrim fallout 3 you know elder scrolls oblivion in other words big open world sandbox games that need to stream an awful lot of data per second from the main ram to the graphics uh, chip in particular the graphics chip in the Wii U was better than the one the 360 and the PlayStation 3. It's more modern, but it was still a couple of years old when the system launched in 2012. Um, so, again, if Nintendo, you know, if... As they say in the video, you know, again, the Digital Foundry video, which again, I keep going on, about, I'll leave a link, in, again, there'll be a link in the description. If you look at it from this perspective, it's the most powerful handheld Nintendo's ever made great and a really massive improvement over the 3ds the 3ds i think is i think 256 megabytes of ram so this thing's got four gigs that's a huge step up an awful lot more main ram bandwidth vastly more advanced graphics so that's fantastic uh breath of the wild certainly would never be technically feasible on the 3ds and if nintendo you know changes tune pretty quick and i think they will change tune pretty quick they better uh, and reposition it as the uh, 3DS's successor that you can also play on your TV, then they'll get all their kind of 3DS third-party support, because that is the one area where Nintendo still gets uh, plenty of third-party support, is in, uh, is on the, uh, on the portable side, particularly from the Japanese industry, because the portable sector is pretty much dedicated either handheld gaming devices or mobile phone gaming is now where is at in japan the home console market there has basically imploded over the last 10 years so that's you know that's cool that's that's fine but if they insist keep on insisting that it's oh it's a new home console or uh, equally importantly insist on, i mean again People didn't buy the Wii U because they were been asked to pay 350 quid for a system with no third-party games and, you know, barely a year out, literally a year out from the launch of the Xbox One, the PS4, and the system tanked. Um, I don't think people will pay 300 for a dedicated handheld. 249 maybe. Um, and maybe if, this, if they position it as a successor to the 3DS, certainly with that big screen, it's kind of tablet-esque, because it is a tablet, you could probably squeeze a lot of the two screen feeds from a 3DS game onto the uh, the Switch and make it backward compatible through software emulation and so on. That would be no problem. And that would get all the 3DS library onto the system. And, you know, they have things like Monster Hunter and stuff, which are hu hugely popular in Japan. And they get that on the, onto the Switch. And it could be a very successful portable platform. But if they keep sticking to the line that, oh, it's a home console, it's a home console... And they charge two nine nine or three fifty for it. They're going to get killed, and um, they really are going to get killed. But uh, yeah, you know, I, uh, you know, I could do. It. I'm, I'm, th I'll th I'm thinking about doing a video about my views on. I don't know, it's just, I suppose I might just say, might as well say it here. I don't like you know speaking ill of the dead, but. The kind of elephant of the room here is kind of Satoru Iwata, who was the second, who was the former CEO head of the company, um, who died of cancer. I think it was last year at this stage. I think it was early last year. Uh, who announced the Nintendo NX at a shareholder meeting, uh, and the, the fact that the company was going to be, you know, supporting mobile in the future, uh, a couple of years ago now. 
And this is basically, the Switch is basically Satoru Iwata's um, last project. This is something, the idea, the concept for what he oversaw, he certainly oversaw a significant chunk of the system's development. And that, to me, is a ginormous red flag. Um, if you're a... Uh, you know, if you're whether you're a Nintendo fanboy or someone like myself, and I get ignore, I I get igno annoyed by Nintendo, um, not because you know, and I don't, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't, what's the word for it? I don't, you know, I don't, I don't, you know derive pleasure from their failures uh, per se but the fact is pretty much every crisis the company has had really since you know since the end of the SNES era has been their own fault going with uh, cartridges op cartridges rather than optical discs and an overly confrontational relationship with the third parties drove them to Sony with the original PlayStation the GameCube not having a proper dual analog stick controller, not having a proper uh, disc format, going with an overly toyish external design that apparently put off some third parties from releasing kind of more adult orientated games on it. Um, the Wii was a great disruptive idea, the Wii was, but it was completely undermined by day one because Nintendo's short sighted, and it is short sighted, obsession with either uh, with preferably selling the hardware at a significant profit at launch, which means they don't invest the money in they should do in the hardware to make the system as capable as it was or could be. I mean, the Wii was a revolutionary concept that was uh, never going to uh, live up to its uh, live up to its uh, expectations uh, the moment it went into production because it's basically the Wii Mote. I mean, motion sensing in in games could be a great revolutionary thing, could still be. But it may well be with the whole VR revolution that's uh, supposedly going on right now. I've got a bit uh, skeptical about that, but it could be. But the Wiimote, the Wiimote is a piece of junk. It's got no gyroscope in it. The accelerometers are incredibly basic. It has only one IR sensor, which is in the controller rather than where they should be, which is in the sensor bar. So your ability for motion tracking is extremely limited. You must for you know, tracking the controller in relation to how you angle it or direct it towards the screen is extremely limited. Um, by insisting on trying to make the Wiimote a, a NES controller as well, by having the button placement the way it is, the buttons that are easily accessible when you're actually trying to play proper Wii games and you're, you're aiming the IR sensor towards the screen on both the Wiimote and the nunchuck is extremely limited. So that means you can't use buttons to take the place, or, or, or you have to use uh, motions and Wii Waggle to take the place of functions that we carried out by buttons on the 360 and the PlayStation 3 controller. But of course, the Wii Mote's precision and sensitivity is so poor in those areas that, they can't, that it doesn't work, particularly in kind of high quality AAA games that require a very fast, precise control. And again, you know, they didn't have to build a HD system with the Wii, but they needed to build a system which they could have in in 2006 that was cheap affordable standard definition that could still have been compliant with the the graphic standards of the day that the 360 and the PlayStation 3 were so the existing brand new game engines and dev tools would work with the hardware rather than old legacy tech i mean the Un epic ported unreal engine 2.0 to the system but they didn't support it i mean why would they i mean they were too busy making money licensing out Unreal 3 to anyone who'd pay for it, and of course making Gears of War 3 and other games for that generation of consoles. Um, so they were, you know, they were, they were an afterthought. Even with the Wii selling almost over 100 million units, they were still an afterthought, particularly for the Western third parties. And the fact is, you know, when the PlayStation 2 had an install base of over 100 million units, Sony was selling the PSP at a loss, and they were spending a fortune uh, developing the uh, PlayStation 3, and yet they still were making money hand over fist, even though the PlayStation 2 sales had gone into a steep decline. Why? Because they'd over 100 million units in install base, and because they were selling, you know, third-party games were being produced in huge numbers and sold, 
you know, day in, day out in, in video games and retail outlets across the world. And they were getting a cut of every one of those third-party game sales, licensing fees and so on. And they were making a fortune. Nintendo gets to a system with over 100 million units sold globally and they're losing money. And why are they losing money? Because the third-party game sales aren't there and as a result the third-party games licensing fee revenue isn't there either. So, you know, as I, once the Wii's, you know, sales go into sustained decline, you know, they stop lo- lose they stop generating anywhere near the level of profit they were on the hardware and they start losing money. Um, and it's again, it's a case of, you know, with the same situations I'd be concerned with, you know, again, you know, who's behind these decisions? Who is behind the, de- you know, the decisions to, you know, not b- build the Wemo properly, not spend the money on the on the Wemo properly, not spend the money on the console properly? Iowata was because he was in charge. You know, who is the, the person who okayed the design and construction of Nintendo's first HD console? and then release it to a market in 2012, barely a year before the next Xbox and the next PlayStation, and the system is technologically inferior in terms of CPU and memory bandwidth to the Xbox 360 and the PlayStation 3, which were seven and six years old, respectively, at the time. So Toro Iowata, that was, it was his fault. Um, he has been, to put it bluntly, the gimmick man. The GameCube, which was designed under uh, Iowata's uh, predecessor, something, Mr. Yamaguchi, or Yamuchi, I can never remember the exact pronunciation. Every system since has been done under, you know, that's been released to date, including, it seems, the Switch, under Satoru Iowata's uh, supervision. And I, the only one in terms of a gimmick that, to my mind, actually worked properly, that actually delivered what it promised in terms of innovation and gameplay and design, was the DS because its touchscreen worked and worked properly. It could del- delivered on what it promised. The Wiimote did not. The Wiimote was a $249 system with an $80 or thereabouts, if you believe some sources, profit margin built in. If they'd spent just $40 of that on the Wiimote, um, it would have transformed the system's performance, and who knows what kind of third-level, third-party support um, they would have got, but they didn't. So uh, my concern at this stage with the Switch, particularly if Nintendo insists sticking to the line that this is our new home console and it's 300 quid or, God forbid, say 350 like the Wii U, um, is that, you know, Satoru Iowata and his obsession with gimmicks and his refusal to just build a plain Jane system that, say, sits around PlayStation 4 level of performance and then with a good online service and just put lots of really good Nintendo first-party games on it and make it as cheap and easy for the third parties to port to it as possible. That would work. You know, they it would work. Um, but they're, you know, no, they want more waggle, they want more gimmick, and, you know, I think it's... I think it runs the risk. You know, Satoru Iowata may yet go down, even though he's dead. I mean, this is the bizarre thing about it. Satoru Iowata is dead, and yet he still may go down in history as the CEO of Nintendo that dragged them kicking and screaming, or should I say crashing, out of the hardware business. Um, he may be the go down in history as the, as the man who killed the Nintendo home console and the Nintendo portable as well. You know, if they do, they have a good chunk of cash in the bank, but you know they can't keep on with this forever. And you know, if it's if it's cheap, if the switch is like two four nine for me would be too much. If it's one nine nine at launch with some decent pack in games like ports of the of really good Wii U games, then it'll be you know it'll be interesting. But if it's if it's three hundred or four hundred or God forbid four hundred bucks somewhere between three or four hundred euros slash dollars and it's a you know and it's you know oh it's a it's a hand it's a not a handheld it's a home console it's a home console with no third party support they are going to crash and burn and uh, Saturo Iowata will get the blame even though he's dead Anyway, uh, if you actually have listened from beginning to end, and assuming I haven't, uh, this is almost a 40-minute long rant, uh, which was originally intended to be 10 to 15 minutes, but uh, there you go. 
Um, if you agree with me, let me know in the comments and like the video. Um, if you don't agree with me, let me know in the comments and like the video. Uh, and I'll respond to them. I do a response video. And if you've actually listened to this whole thing, uh, again, let me know in the comments. And if you haven't already uh, subscribed, uh, uh, please do so. Their press conference is in early, is it January the 13th? I believe it is at 4 a.m. here in Ireland. I will be watching that. Um, I might do a, 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 a reaction video to it or like do a an audio reaction thing to it or watch it and just comment and just upload it onto YouTube. But uh, yeah, uh, they, they really... Um, my concern is, I mean, they could blow us away, but my concern right now is it's going to be expensive, it's going to have no third-party support, and they're going to get killed. Anyway, this is uh, Defub21. Uh, as I've said, like, and if you haven't already subscribed, please do so, and comment in the comments. Toodaloo.